Six story chapters, six challenges. Arthur Becomes is a Red Dead Redemption 2 mini-series that will completely transform the game as we progress. Every chapter of Arthur Morgan's story will come with a brand new challenge, ranging anywhere from gun-specific restrictions to ridiculous modern novelties. We'll see Arthur adopt new abilities, face new obstacles, and traverse the West in never-before-seen ways over the course of six chaotic episodes. Can we actually complete the game while dealing with Arthur's ever-changing identity crisis? Well, only time will tell. So join us as the journey continues in Chapter 5, where Arthur becomes the survivor. One shot, one punch, one misstep, and it's all over. Today we'll be trying to beat Chapter 5 of Red Dead Redemption 2 without taking any damage. There is of course a mod enabled that keeps my HP locked to 1 at all times, so if I do take any sort of damage, you'll know about it. Suck on this. Now look, you might think I'm going down a potentially devastating and agonizing path here, but I've got to tell you, I am more confident about this than you might think, okay? I reckon with an ability as powerful as Deadeye, we may be able to get through this mostly unscathed, where others have been tortured in similar runs. No! You know what they say, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Except when it comes to 1 HP runs of video games, in that case both pain and suffering are a very unavoidable part of the process. Today, I'm going to tell you a story of my pain and suffering, and how trying to clear Guama without taking any damage shifted my perspective on life itself. It all started with a harmless walk across the beach. The coast was beautiful, the air was crisp, I was walking into this fresh-faced and ready to take on everything this island had to give. But unbeknownst to me, by this point, I'd already made my first mistake, and it was a mistake that I would pay for dearly. Despite how hideously difficult every no-hit run I've ever witnessed has been, I was charging at this with a mindset you wouldn't believe. I was entering this realm under the impression that this won't take long. <laughs> you are a fool! I am going to crush you! To an extent, I actually believed the game was on my side here. This wasn't going to be a GTA 5 Oko situation because this isn't GTA 5. I had three distinct advantages that left me feeling confident. One, I wasn't doing the entire game. In fact, I was actually attempting the shortest portion of the game by a long shot. That means less strats to learn, less possible mistakes, etc. Two, Arthur Morgan just so happens to be gifted with the literal manipulation of time itself, so Deadeye was to be my get out of jail free card in a combat situation. And three, this is 1899, not 2013, so portable automatic machines of death were not going to be a problem. Mathematically speaking, I'd be dodging less bullets for less of the time. Now, is this logic unbelievably flawed? Yes, but can you blame me? No. The name of this chapter was not hyperbole. I was going for a god run. I don't know what to tell you. I'd pinned it to a maximum of five attempts before I'd cleared this chapter and made off with a victory so spectacular that I could not possibly reach a peak as high ever again. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, Isaiah, please get on with it. We've been staring at you walking across this beach since the video started. People are going to start clicking off soon. A lot of people probably already have, dude. So please, move on to the actual run. And to that I say, well... I don't quite understand what you mean there, fella. This is the actual run. You think any of this is skippable? A skippable walk in Red Dead 2. Don't make me laugh, man. What do you think this is, a video game or something? This is cinema. And cinema cannot simply be skipped over. You will sit in your gamer chair. You will hold the W key and you will walk. You will walk and you will watch. And once the cinematic experience does finally finish and the actual gameplay begins, you better hope that your delusions of a first try god run aren't just delusions like mine were, because with every fail, you'll be re-experiencing said cinema for another 8 minutes before you get to retry. That was how my first run went. 
And it was at this moment I realized just how high the stakes were for failing. And, you know, sure, I, I could have just restarted the checkpoint if I died this early into a run and jumped right back into the fight, but I was determined to do this properly. And if we were getting technical, Chapter 5 starts the moment Arthur wakes up on the beach with his lungs full of ocean water. It doesn't start at the first convenient checkpoint. So yeah, my first attempt didn't go so well. I think I was just feeling a bit rusty or something, and, and for some reason I hadn't even utilized my Deadeye abilities yet, so it sucked I had to do this walk all over again, but my confidence wasn't shaken. On my second attempt, I managed to make even less progress than before, primarily because the death was not my fault at all. And that's not me having a gamer moment, okay? I'm not trying to palm the blame off onto somebody else, it's just that this literally wasn't my fault, I promise. You see, there's a possibility that you can be shot before the unskippable cutscene even finishes playing here. So, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I can, there's nothing I can do here. But that's okay, because attempt number three was the one. I knew it from the moment I flawlessly cleared the first wave of enemies who had their back to me that I had shaken off the rust and the bad luck. It was finally time to experience the second shootout. The second shootout was a sketchy skirmish with the local military that would teach me the true strength of my friendship with the Deadeye meter. I don't know how I wasn't killed with the sloppy shooting I was doing here, but Deadeye held my hand just long enough for me to survive. Chapter 5 strips us of all our purchased weapons, food, tonics, and supplements, but thankfully provides us with a small cache of supplies to draw from before every mission. Obviously, anything that lifts my health and stamina core is useless for this run, but anything that replenishes my Deadeye core is basically worth its weight in Robux. There's also a volcanic pistol and a double barrel shotgun available for you to take here, which I did, but I had a feeling the bolt action rifle would be my ride or die for this chapter. I made my way to the next mission with a satchel so full of guama rum you'd think I was off to fail the challenge by drinking myself to death. There were two missions to choose from on the map now, one with Dutch and one with maybe the Riddler or something, I wasn't quite sure. It had just occurred to me here that I hadn't actually played this chapter of Red Dead 2 since early 2019 and I had little to no recollection of how these missions played out. Now if that isn't the perfect way to approach a no-hit run of a video game, then I don't know what is. Upon approaching the question mark mission, I was hit by two things. Profound sadness at the sight of a man who's been deprived of a dignified death, and a tranquilizer dart. Thankfully, neither of these things cause actual damage to the player, so I was free to move on. Upon entering the question mark mission, I was hit by two more things. This random dude's right hand, repeatedly, and the realization that for a no-hit run, I sure am being hit a lot. Thankfully, these punches are basically a part of a sort of cutscene. They don't actually take any health from the player, so we're good. As soon as this guy's back was turned, I brought forth all of my Call of Duty Black Ops 1 training, ripped myself out of my control constraints and taught him exactly what happens when you get in the way of someone and their 7 hour session of Dead Ops Arcade. <laughs> After rescuing these two locals, I was thrust into a heavily scripted stealth section. There's no challenge or risk here, the enemies all have the exact same pathing every time, all you have to do is follow whoever's leading you through basically. It's a good thing for this challenge, don't get me wrong, but it's also a very boring thing if you have to do it more than once. Thankfully, this was the god run, and it would be the last time I'd see this section of the game. Who would have thought that without a basic understanding of how the mission works in a normal playthrough, you probably won't be able to beat it without being hit a single time? Well apparently I didn't think that, because this didn't deter me from my 5 attempt vision. The survivor would not back down to a petty death at the hands of the hangman fake name. Attempt number four of the god run went a little something like this. Eight minutes of beach, no RNG cutscene death, serious flirtations with alcoholism, and finally, some evidence that I can indeed learn from my mistakes. With the hangman dead, this officially marked the furthest I'd been in the run without a death so far. Celebrations were cut a little short due to the nerve-wracking shootout that followed the death of the hangman. Turns out these fellas had quite an attachment to him because these were easily the most aggressive enemies so far. Especially this guy that sprinted down the left side and actually compromised my cover at one point. 
If that guy was scripted to do that every time, I'd have to be very careful here in future runs. But anyway, forget that. There wouldn't be any future runs, because this was all a part of my five attempt vision, you see. And upon destroying yet another small army without so much as sustaining a scratch, I decided I was going to change that to a four attempt vision because attempt number four was so obviously the run that there was no sense in keeping the Misnomer around anymore. After refilling my supplies, I made my way through the jungle and up some cliffs to meet the man himself. And surprise, surprise, Dutch had devised a plan to get us out of this mess. Now, this was my very first attempt at a kind and benevolent despo, which had its own kind of beach walk thing going on. Not as painful as eight minutes on the sand before every attempt, of course, but the unskippable shimmy along the cliff, followed by another unskippable cutscene, definitely hurt. Anyway, after Dutch murders the horrible old crone in cold blood, horrible old crone, but you killed him. We move on to a little stealth section that poses no threat so long as we don't alert anyone. This area is important though, particularly this room. Here we can find a guaranteed spawn of chewing tobacco. And let me tell you, chewing tobacco just might be the backbone of this run. You got a Siggy Bop brain. That's what no. they're gonna call you, mate. They're gonna no. call you Siggy Bop brain. No, no. It fills and fortifies our dead eye meter temporarily and is also very quick to consume, especially compared to tonics, which take forever to drink. This area felt so risky that once the combat actually kicked off, I felt too scared to really move. Staying out in the open was basically asking to be shot, but I did it anyway. Again, unfamiliarity with the structure of the mission was still my biggest enemy. Eventually I wisened up a little and took cover here, which actually seemed to be a pretty safe spot. Unless I peeked too long, I didn't think it was even possible for me to be shot here. Well, aside from this cheeky little fellow who snuck up behind me, but yeah, besides that it was a good spot. After the initial shootout, Dutch determines there are simply too many enemies and decides we must escape. Now, Dutch is absolutely correct. Things get kind of batshit insane here. He begins guiding us to the exit, but there are so many enemies in our path that there was just no chance of me getting through unscathed. I completely panicked, ran in the other direction, was almost killed, and then accidentally found one of the most useful strats of the entire run. I'm a natural. When running too far away from Dutch, the game automatically fails. Now I was expecting it to spawn me right next to a bunch of enemies or something, but upon reloading the checkpoint, I was actually spawned ahead of the swarm right by the exit. Now, while this is of course an unbelievably helpful strategy, doing all of this on the fly and accidentally discovering it left me feeling a little bit off balance, you know? In my confusion, all I could think to do here was run as far away as possible and hide behind this porta potty or shed or whatever it was. I eventually failed because Dutch had legged it out of range, but I was given yet another shot at not screwing this up. But you see, the problem with not screwing things up here the problem that really should have been addressed from the beginning, the problem I'd chosen to ignore, was that no amount of blind confidence could change the fact that I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And so, when I completely neglect cover and try to escape into the jungle alongside Dutch, despite being instructed to take out the rest of the enemies, I really shouldn't have been that surprised when I was shot in the back. So, yeah, pretty obvious I was going the wrong way about this. There was no god run. Let's, let's snap back to reality for a moment, okay? There was no god run. There was no four attempt vision. I was rushing into a chapter I could barely remember and expecting to emerge victorious without any resistance. Yeah, sure, chapter five is the shortest chapter, but like, I wasn't even halfway through here. I hadn't even encountered close to all the surprises this run had in store for me. I hadn't been met with the countless workarounds that would need to be made, the trial and error that was in front of me. I was still confident this was possible, of course, but not without a fight first. So instead of deciding to restart the chapter here, I opted instead for a complete test run. I'd finished the chapter all the way through regardless of how many deaths, because I really just needed time to not only experiment with the challenge, but also just to refresh myself on what even happens in a normal playthrough. So yeah, attempt 4 blossomed into one of the most important attempts of this challenge, but not exactly for the reasons I originally thought. This would become the cornerstone of everything that followed. A long journey of discovery that would teach me much. So much, actually, that I need to get on with it because there is a lot to summarize here, so 
This is what I learnt in attempt 4. First of all, don't try and escape into the bushes with Dutch here. It's not what Rockstar wants you to do, and so it's not possible. I thought there wasn't enough cover here to survive at first, but if you just take a few steps back, we have the perfect rock to get the job done with. I expected Hell Hath No Fury to be a real issue, but most of it is actually quite safe despite the chaos. I'd say the riskiest part is the enemies that storm the castle towards the beginning, mostly because you have to blindly exit through this doorway and meet them all head on. Or at least, that's what the game wants you to do. It's actually possible to run back up the stairs like a coward and shoot down on them from above. This mission's far from free, don't get me wrong, but it was a lot less troublesome than I was expecting. I thought I'd have died a couple of times on the cannon or something, but to my knowledge, there's actually no way to take damage here even if you wanted to. In fact, the one and only time I died in this mission was in the most pathetic and easily avoidable way possible. Paradise Mercifully Departed starts with a free stealth section. You know, you just stab this fella up, plant some dynamite, and head on out. Unfortunately, it's followed by a shootout that's sketchier than a See My Nudes Here link in the YouTube comments. Seriously, don't click those. I mean, just look at how much of Arthur sticks out of this piece of cover. I, I don't know how I wasn't destroyed here immediately, but I guess I got lucky. It wouldn't fly in the future though. Same with this part here, it's pure luck that I wasn't put down on the spot with cover like this. Here we get plenty of time to prepare for the next wave of enemies, and plenty of help from our companions too. This shootout isn't risk-free of course, but if I carefully time when I pop up to shoot here, there shouldn't be any reason for me to die. So far, things had gone way smoother than I was expecting. Probably a good idea to stay away from lit dynamite though, I'll definitely remember that for next time. Stand back. The next shootout was simple. I could hang way back in cover and just take pot shots while the others rushed in. I doubted this would need much optimization, if any, in the future. So far, all of my deaths had just come down to my own stupidity. For example, forgetting that you have to kick the gun to the captain and instead deciding to shoot someone in the standoff is not a good move at all. I basically just floundered my way through the next section with zero nerves or regard for my safety at all. I'd already died a bunch of times. This was just a test run after all, but looking back on it, it's actually pretty insane how lucky I was getting. When Old Mate jumps up into the cannon and starts acting a little wacky, he's actually not a threat at all. He talks a big game with the big gun and the big explosions, but it's all scripted fluff. On top of that, beyond this first dude, there weren't any more enemies on the ground, so the end of this section was about as free as it gets. You need to get that cannon out there! And just like that, we were off Guarma and back on our way to American soil. This is America! It almost felt surreal pulling up on the shoreline of Van Horn, but at the same time, it felt right, you know? This is where I was supposed to be. Off the island, and on my way back to Shady Bell. Dear Uncle Tacitus is really about as simple as not being an idiot. Really, that's all it takes. You read the letter, stay hidden from the scripted enemies with the easily avoidable paths, and slip out the front door. If you can manage to not be a complete fool in Dear Uncle Tacitus, then it's smooth sailing to Fleeting Joy. Fleeting Joy is basically Red Dead 2's Doom level, and is to me one of the most memorable missions in the game. So I already had a feeling this one might be some trouble. And yeah, it was. I was so terrified to come face to face with all the enemies in the forced dead eye sequence that I preemptively started looking for ways to avoid it. I tried sneaking up the embankment to kill the enemies early, but the game shuts you down for doing that so fast you don't even have time to aim your weapon at them. Next, I had a stroke of genius when I realized I still had some dynamite left over from Guarma. However, in true Rockstar fashion, upon using it, I failed for being spotted by the Pinkertons. Right. It was obvious that facing these guys head on was going to be unavoidable, so I tried a bunch of different ways to clear it without being shot. Tried backing out, tried painting the enemies with Deadeye, tried just about everything except for the most obvious thing, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. For now, just rest easy knowing that past Isaiah was led astray by a big, fat, red herring. Shooting the guy on the Gatling gun and then backing out seemed to work quite well. It wasn't perfect, but for now it was good enough for me. 
I'm literally screaming through the screen trying to warn myself right now, but anyway, yeah, this strategy seemed okay. I went through and found a couple vantage points for the next few waves of enemies, but still left feeling a little unsure about how this would go in a full run. Fleeting Joy was just too late in the chapter to have so much of it left uncertain and unplanned, but for now I was just too eager to move on. And just like that, we were diving into the final mission of this godforsaken chapter. Charles. Will you ride with me? Always. Where are we headed? Up past Butcher Creek. Smurfy Brew Country. That's why I'm asking you to ride with me. There's always something so ominous about the last mission of a challenge run in this series, but let me tell you, for a challenge run as unforgiving as this one, it's got a pretty weak final boss. All we had to do was roll up into Murphy country on horseback, reunite ourselves with all our beautiful custom weapons, and give Beaver Hollow a little renovation alongside Charles. I'm thinking we put the campfire here, sleeping quarters here, and just leave every single Murphy brood that we mercilessly slaughter at the entrance of this cave. Y you know, for decoration. Barely any of these guys have anything besides melee weapons, and the few that do have guns are deeper in the cave where they can be easily picked off. They are a little spooky considering how devastating it would be to lose a run to them on the final shootout of the chapter, but yeah, they're easy enough. After that, we just release this poor woman they've kept locked down here for god only knows how long and return her to her family in Annisburg. And that's it. That's literally all we gotta do. I, I was feeling that confidence crawling back in, let me tell you. 14 deaths later, most of which were due to testing in Fleeting Joy. That wasn't half bad. Not only that, but this test run made the entire chapter feel even shorter than I'd remembered. Of course, now all I had to do was put every bit of information I'd learned together and, you know, not make a single mistake for about an hour and 40 minutes. Definitely not my strong suit. Okay, so this video is very long. I get that. But I spent such a long time explaining my process there because my biggest takeaway was how much Attempt 4 seemed to shrink the beast for me. That is a shocking phrase. What I mean is, not only did Attempt 4 present me with all the problems I'd have to solve, but it also proved to me that this wasn't insurmountable at all. I was sure the chapter still had some surprises for me, but I felt like I'd ironed out a lot of the important stuff very early on, and that was motivating. Now, I think it's important for me to mention one more thing before we move on. I told you in the beginning about the hellish, unskippable trek across the beach, right? Now, I didn't lie to you about the beach. I would never lie to you about the beach, but I did leave some information out, okay? You see, the unskippable stroll is only half of the problem when it comes to starting up a new run in Chapter 5. The other half actually occurs before your toes even touch the sand. If I want to start a new attempt as the survivor, I can't just reload a save that spawns me here at the beginning of Chapter 5, because technically, you can't save the game until the first mission of Chapter 5 is complete. So that means, and please stick with me here, in order to attempt Chapter 5 in its entirety, I have to reload a save I made just prior to the last mission of Chapter 4 and play through the entire level before my sorry soul even sniffs the coast of Gwarma again. So, if we take into account the 8 minutes of beach walking, plus the additional 20 minutes of Chapter 4 bank heisting prior to that, that's almost half an hour before I even get another shot at re-attempting this challenge after a fail. If I'm lucky and I fail in the first shootout, then yes, I do have the option to restart the mission and only suffer the beach walk. But, if I take a single step any further than the first mission, it's goodbye to the sand and hello to the Denis. I don't know who at Rockstar woke up one day and decided they'd design it like this, but design it like this they did. I really don't see the harm of allowing the player to save the game after waking up on the beach, but I suppose that would just break the immersion, wouldn't it? That'd disrupt the flow of the story, so I guess I'll just have to stomach the extra 30 minutes of pissing around until I get to re-attempt what I failed. Look, I know I sound a little bit cranky right now, maybe even a little bit off my rocker, but you have to understand, this run isn't that hard, okay? It's not. It's really not. All it is, is a matter of throwing enough attempts at the wall with enough of the right strategies in place until you get that one run you need. And I was more than okay with that, but this one very unfortunate design choice was nothing short of evil. 
I could only hope now that the golden attempt would arrive sooner rather than later. With most of the major obstacles mapped out, I was heading into attempt number 5 with renewed patience. Which I was definitely going to need, because from this point on, trial and error was the game. I needed to play this out until the chapter literally couldn't surprise me anymore, you know, I, I had to become Gwarma. Despite fully understanding this, it didn't make the process any less painful. On attempt number 5, I suffered the dreaded cutscene death, which was just a really lovely welcome back. Attempt number 6 was a little better. Here I made it all the way back to the hangman, but in an uncontrollable wave of anxiety, I decided to completely change my chosen cover at the last possible second, which of course resulted in me being shot and killed. New rule, okay? No matter what happens in the heat of the moment, STICK TO THE FUCKING PLAN! On my seventh attempt, I decided to go for Dutch's mission first. Horrible old crone, but you killed him. I was basically choosing either one based on whichever I was feeling more nervous about at the time. And I want to stress that my nerves were less geared towards the idea of failing, and more so geared towards the fact that I knew a fail meant half an hour of just repeating the same bullshit until I get to re-attempt the challenge. Honestly, it was just soul-crushing knowing that this was the consequence of making a single mistake. A single mistake, such as forgetting the enemy that spawns behind me here, and being killed as a result. Attempt 8 and 9 was a painful back-to-back -back special, truly a moment in time that I'd like to forget. Although I suppose Attempt 8 and 9 was important in a way, because it was due to the double cutscene death that I devised the book strategy. <laughs> The book strategy. Basically, any time I had to walk across the beach, I'd just rest a book against the W key and leave the room to do something else. It had really become that mind-numbing by this point that I didn't even want to be present for this part anymore. As we slid into double digits, I actually managed to pass the first cutscene, as well as coast through the first and second shootouts. This time on Despo, I found a more reliable way to tell when I should abandon Dutch for the deliberate fail, which is basically a line of dialogue that told me to put my my shoes on and get going. I escorted Dutch through the cornfields, took out the enemies by the river, and moved right on to Savagery Unleashed. I was eager to finally move past these two missions in a proper attempt since it felt like such an insurmountable obstacle at this point. I was so eager actually that apparently I was moving a little too fast here for Rockstar's taste since they decided to pull me over for speeding in the most brutal way possible. This was insanely frustrating, as you can imagine, mainly because I had no idea why. To my knowledge, I'd followed the rules, but after watching this clip back a few times, I realized my mistake had been moving in on the hangman before Leon does which is apparently punishable by death around here. This was almost a deathless personal best for me, so I, I just had to set the challenge down and decide to attack it the next day. Attempt 11 took me back to basics, reaffirming to me the importance of fully reloading my bolt action after every shot so I don't get killed while cocking the rifle. Honestly, this might be one of the most important micro strategies of the entire run since you can't cock any weapons before popping out of cover. 11 angry attempts became 12 as my life ended ended in the cornfields of Despo. A stray bullet may have penetrated my body causing irreparable internal damage, but the real cause of death here was me loitering around Dutch for far too long. This taught me the importance of abandoning him in the corn and zooming for the river as soon as I could. The game can throw all the threats of mission failure at you at once, it's, it's fucking bluffing, okay? It, it's talking shit. Leave Dutch to die and run for that river if you want to live. Unlucky 13 was really as unlucky as you can imagine bit of a kick in the guts really. When I was about 14, I got tripped over while playing football and shattered both the bones in my left forearm. On attempt 14, the survivor caught air on a small boulder and shattered my will to live. Attempt number 15 was claimed by the always nerve-wracking Despo when some never-before-seen RNG entered the arena. I will say, this never happened before and thankfully never happened again, but if someone was ever crazy enough to do a full playthrough of no damage, not me, Enemies randomly spawning to the side here would definitely call for some concern. 16, 17, 18, 19, and attempt 20 were all over before they really got the chance to get started. And that's actually when it occurred to me that Unlucky 13 had had a longer lasting effect than I first realized. I shit you not, since attempt 13, I hadn't passed a single mission beyond the first two shootouts. 
Not a single one. You have no idea how painful that truly is back to back. That was a lot of walks along this beach. Listen, dude. No, I don't want that. Attempt 21 was probably the most desperate I'd been to see at least some progress here. I'd spent hours hammering out attempts without really learning anything from them. So when I finally crossed through the first two shootouts and into Despo again, I was especially determined to keep this run alive. Anyway, I didn't stick around with Dutch in the cornfields long enough to be annihilated this time, and the river shootout actually went pretty smooth, so it seemed the curse had been broken. For now. In Savagery Unleashed, I made sure to let Leon carry on ahead of me to avoid dying here once again, stupid fucking game, and while this shootout still made me super nervous, I completed it without any problems. And yeah, this was officially the furthest I'd made it so far in a proper run. Truly a monumental achievement, if you ask me, but the job wasn't even close to being finished yet, so I postponed the celebrations and continued on into Hell Hath No Fury. Now, I didn't really have much more to learn from this mission, honestly. It was pretty much free as long as I remained cautious and took my shots wisely. The only thing that spooked the absolute shit out of me was this close call towards the end of the mission. Nearly took my toes off. After destroying the warship, it was time to tackle the latter portion of the chapter. Obviously, there's only so much experience you can have with the second half when you're usually stuck on the first couple of missions, so to put it simply, I was not feeling confident. Somehow, though, I was just scraping through these shootouts, basically winging it at every moment. On the one hand, I want to say I had the realistic mindset that, hey, this probably isn't possible until I get some late chapter experience. But on the other hand, I think the idea of this run not being the last was just far too painful for me to fully accept. So yeah, my hopes were well and truly up by this point. Once the standoff was over, I was really treading water with cinder blocks tied to my ankles. I kind of just hung around this boulder and hoped I wouldn't be shot at this point. Somehow, I really don't know how, but it worked, and before I knew it, I was winging my way through to the end of the mission. It was only once I blasted Old Maid out of the tower and headed for the boat that I truly realized realized what this run meant to me. This was my opportunity to leave the beach walks behind, to never see Lenny die ever again. This was my shot at freedom. 21 attempts might not seem like much in the grand scheme of things, but considering the path that must be taken just to even start the goddamn chapter, I can safely say that I was ready to have this one over and done with. This time on Dear Uncle Tacitus, I was successfully not an idiot, and cleared the stealth section without any issues. It's just a shame that my prize for getting this far was having to deal with fleeting joy. Because, well, when you're as nervous as I was, you don't really deal with fleeting joy. Fleeting joy deals with you. You mistook it for Why weakness. Is now I will show strength and you may mistake it for brutality. There is no escape for any of you. I shall hunt you to the ends of the earth and the end of time. This I killed your friends. This really started to irritate me. And you are each and every one of you. I wish I could explain to you what I was even trying to do there, but to be completely honest, I think what you just saw was an attempt to once again make a last minute change of plans. And man, that's really disappointing for me to see here, because I thought we made a rule about that like 10 attempts ago. Can you please remind us, what was that rule again, Mr. Michael DeSanta from Grand Theft Auto 5? Stick to the fucking plan! The plan was to shoot the dude on the Gatling gun, exit out of Deadeye, and hopefully escape into the cabin without being shot in the back. Not only did I miss my first shot, but upon doing so, I prematurely exited Deadeye, thought about running, but then decided to stay in front of all the people that were ready to shoot me. Very smart. Oh. Now, rather than letting this horrible failure completely destroy me, I spent the next 20 minutes becoming so familiar with my worst fear that I could no longer fear it. I'd gone through this entire challenge being so terrified of this shootout, even with a strategy I thought was decent enough to get me through. And that red herring I talked about earlier? Yeah, I probably should have explored my options a little bit more before accepting it like it was my only option. You wanna know what was way more reliable than backing out of this shootout? Just shooting everyone? Yeah, 
yeah, shooting the enemies like the game wants you to do. I actually didn't try that, believe it or not. And if you do it in this exact order, you're pretty much guaranteed success. I must have tried it upwards of 10 times, and yeah, if you just shoot the fucking enemies, they never even get the chance to fire back. Now this begs the question, am I a fool for not testing this out more thoroughly to begin with? Well, I'll leave that up to you to decide, but that's not important anyway. What is important is that we got there in the end. And with this finding in mind, I made sure I got to know the rest of Fleeting Joy better than I know most of my family members. Because if I was ever to get back up to this point again, I was making it my mission to ensure that it was the last time. From the beginning, I was of the understanding that this was not a challenge of raw difficulty. It was a test of endurance. How many times would I bang my head against this brick wall until it finally crumbled to rubble before me? There was no doubt in my mind that it would eventually crumble. The question was just when? 21 attempts hadn't been enough, and 22 wasn't either. Attempt 23 ended as so many had before it, and while attempt 24 went better than most, it seemed there were still obstacles left for me to optimize. My 25th attempt was among the most painful of the entire challenge, driving me to the brink of insanity with a death I never could have seen coming. Not only had I never been shot in this spot before, but the shot seems to have been fired long before the enemy wave had even technically started from an enemy I couldn't even see. It was so easy to lose motivation in moments like these, especially given all the time I had to contemplate my failure before each attempt. The thing is though, no matter how much motivation I lost, the hope never exactly went with it. I knew I was in the endgame, and I knew it was only a matter of time before the brick wall fell to pieces. I had a sore forehead to prove it. The survivor had become something more like the taskmaster over the course of this journey. Every fail was just another dot point in my notes, another strategy listed down, another workaround figured out. And by attempt 26, I was robbing safes and strutting across that beach with a confidence like that of my first attempt. The only difference between then and now was all in the experience. We'd spent days of our lives enduring, but now it was time to survive. RNG couldn't touch us if it tried, and we breezed through the first two shootouts like they were nothing. Savagery Unleashed went by in a blur. First I was sneaking through the ruins, and the next thing I knew the hangman was going down for the last time. The army that followed simply faded away like dust in the breeze. By the time Dutch and the survivor hit the despo, we were operating on pure momentum. There wasn't a chance we were being snuck up on, and the only failure here was a purely deliberate one. Corn shucks slapped in our faces as we took off towards the river. The river that would soon double as a grave for the endless foes that dared to oppose our position behind the mighty boulder. Hell hath no fury like the survivor on a god run. A few quick scopes and a couple cannon blasts was all it took for us to move on unscathed. I hadn't taken my previous failure here lightly. This section had been rehearsed and rehearsed until I could be sure of every aspect. Once cleared, it was time to put my new position into practice. To avoid any unexpected early shots, I stuck behind this building rather than the designated cover and crossed my fingers for no unforeseen obstacles. Raging enemies emerged from the corn, bloodthirsty and battle ready, only to be planted in the soil alongside it seconds later. The new spot had been a resounding success, and so we pushed on. One brief standoff later, and we were back behind another boulder, picking off enemies through the trees. To my surprise, the boulder held up as a reliable enough spot again, and before I knew it, I was taking control of the cannon, blasting that fella to smithereens, and escaping Gwarma without a single scratch. Once the survivor hit the shore, it was time to start thinking seriously again about fleeting joy. Dear Uncle Tacitus could be completed on autopilot, but the chaos to follow would be very different indeed. Not a single enemy was granted the opportunity to fire our way, but the job was far from over. There would be waves of enemies arriving at any moment, so I scrambled to get into position. But there was a problem. For some reason, the back door was locked, leaving just enough time for me to stall in a panic and fail due to a dead companion. And just like that, 
I was repeating my worst nightmare all over again. This time, the door flew open, and I was free to put the rest of the plan in motion. After that, well, it's all a blur. The survivor just did what he had to do. Brute country. I want to build tension here, you know? I want to be able to tell you of my dangerous struggle to take out the final enemies of the chapter. I want to tell you of the last stomach-dropping close calls, you know? I want to do that. But the truth is, the moment Fleeting Joy was completed, I was at peace. Murphy Decimation wasn't entirely risk-free, but it didn't matter. As far as I was concerned, the wall had been broken. We had endured, and we had survived. 26 painful attempts later, and I'd completed Chapter 5 of Red Dead Redemption 2 without taking any damage. I now officially never want to lay eyes on another beach again, and preferably never want to engage in another bank robbery either. Although in that case, it really depends if this video gets demonetized or not. I didn't expect to be spending so much time with the survivor, in all honesty, but in a sort of sick and twisted way, I'm glad that I did. I believe this challenge may have made me a more grateful person, as every second I spend not doing it feels sweeter than ever before. I hope you all enjoyed the second last episode of Arthur Becomes, and as always, thank you for watching. Horrible old crone. But you killed him.